Hi, this is David Young, and you're listening to Awakened Nation. A huge shift is taking place on planet Earth. People seem to be waking up. Tired of the way things used to be, they are creating something brand new and changing the world we live in. My name is Brad Zalas, and I get to sit down with the next generation of idea makers, the disruptors, and the game changers. Everyday people, just like you and me, from all over, who are doing amazing things. Welcome to Awakened Nation. Hey, everybody. I have a good friend of mine on that, uh, man, how how long ago was it, Dave? We, we met, uh, wow, be through, through your brother, at yeah. least 25. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what blew my mind is I had, I had heard you were a musician, but I finally saw you on stage at this big seminar, and you got up and you pulled out these two recorders, and we were transported. I have never heard music like that before. And it just, I was, I was mesmerized by your talent. And it, it, all I can say is we, we went to another level. And I'm sure you've heard that before uh, about your music, but um, we are just so jazzed to have you on Awakened Nation today. Thanks for coming on, my oh, friend. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Yeah, there's actually, um, there's a reason why, um, why my music takes things up to another level and it wasn't anything that I really, that I planned, but I started to play two flutes at one time um, in 1990. And one of the things that I found besides the fact that visually it was really, it was really a good thing for me to do because it was really memorable, you know, but right. sonically when, when you play two recorders at one time, the two flutes create, a third tone, it's called a triharmonic tone. And that's a frequency. And when people have near death experiences and they experience the heavenly dimension, they describe experiencing this, this frequency in heaven. And I do music at the conferences wow. for people who have had near death experiences. And I've heard over and over again that the, like what you said, it's the closest thing they ever could compare to the energy and the frequency that they experienced during their near death experience was the music that I created at my meditations with my flutes. Wow. It's just incredible. Let me read David's bio. David Young is an award-winning artist, author, and musician well-known for playing two Renaissance flutes, also known as recorders. He plays them in harmony. He has recorded over 60 albums over an illustrious career and sold over 1 million copies. David's music, revered for its soothing sounds and healing properties, is a staple in hospitals, healing centers, and spas throughout the country. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have ever had a massage or you've gone to a yoga retreat or you've gone somewhere to do some meditation, chances are you have heard David Young's work. Uh, David travels through the country hosting his signature workshops, a portal between heaven and earth, which blends his healing music and his enlightening guided meditations, and where countless attendees report remarkable experiences. We're going to talk about those in a minute. These experiences are the inspiration for many of David's songs and paintings and chronicled in his book, The True Story of Jesus and His Wife, Mary Magdalene. I want you to listen to some of his music right now. has a physical body an emotional body and we all have a soul as well and I think that in modern psychology people have forgotten that and I think what's happening during David's meditations is people are actually having these spiritual experiences that involves their soul uh, coming to new levels of awareness and I really do believe that the music itself his channeling it his being the guide so to speak really does help people to open up spiritual self so that we can connect to the higher consciousness I went up and met two women that I understood to be Virgin Mary and um, Mary Magdalene. 
We just see over and over at these events people having a profound sense of inner peace, having a profound sense of, of centeredness and hope for the future. Probably 80% of the time people walk out of there feeling just very elevated, uplifted. My only child passed four and a half years ago and I have felt my heart really heavy and I felt like Sean was coming back and there was, wasn't in a physical form but just saying, Mom, you gotta let this grief go because you're keeping me down here and I want to ascend. As the music went, I could feel him ascending and my heart feels better, it feels lighter. Music is very special because music bypasses the neocortex of the brain, which is the thinking part of the brain, and so it, it hits us on a primal level. By trade, I'm a psychologist and a nurse and a social worker, and now with all this spiritual development, I have a spiritual counseling practice and an advanced energy healing practice, and I love using David's CDs in my sessions with people because it just quickly relaxes them. The flutes are so calming and harmonizing and, and comforting. I know that it slows their brain waves. Like it takes them to the theta, takes them out of this, out of the realm of, of you know, the monkey mind and, and the racing and they don't even know it. I could feel the notes in my body. His music actually has um, a power in it that is able to like enter into your body and create a change, an opening for greater good. I wanted to see my grandmother and my auntie, and I did. Yeshua and Magdalene and Mother Mary were there. Jesus and Mother Mary were there for me as well, which is kind of cool. Um, but they were really just there to introduce me to my high school friends that have died. I had ascended masters that came down and they were around me. Archangel Michael came in first, and Raphael, Muriel, Gabriel. I had a complete conversation with Mahatma Gandhi. A good friend of mine that had killed himself came through. The Archangel Gabriel. My late husband came to me, reassuring me how blissful his existence was now. This really beautiful young woman showed up. I think it was my guardian angel. I was surprised because I saw Jesus. We chatted a, a little bit and, and really the message that was coming through was for me was to not be afraid. I'm not alone. By the way, uh, those of you who are listening in, uh, I just want to let you know, we caught David starting his world tour, and he's in England right now. So it's the end of the day over there and uh, beginning of the morning here in uh, the United States. But Dave, um, you know, this you told me about this all of a sudden because we've been trying to get you on the show for about a year now. And you're just like, hey, let's do it now. And I'm like, but you're in England. <laughs> it's like, it was great. Mm. Well, um, I'm here in England for a month, and I was in Birmingham last week. I was in Glastonbury this past weekend, and um, now I tomorrow we start events all over all over England, and we're extending the tour another week or two. And it's really uh, it's really Great. fun to be here because all the music that I grew up loving, my favorite bands like Led Zeppelin and The Who and Bad Company, you know, they were. Jethro Tull, Pink Floyd, they were all from England. So being yeah. here in England feels special, you know? It really does. I I can just imagine for you as an artist or a recording artist and a musician, uh, a guitar player, this is just like, you know, you're, you're just walking in this world that you have read about for so long and listened. And now you're actually standing there where, you know, like Paul McCartney and John Lennon um, created this magic. Yeah. Well, you know, um, John and Paul really needed each other because the two of them each lost their moms at a young age. And to fill that right. space in their lives, their friendship 
fill that space in their lives. But one of the things that most people don't know that I didn't know, because I wasn't a Beatles fan. You know, I was a Led Zeppelin. I, I liked hard rock yeah. music. I was too young to be a Beatles fan. <laughs> right. Um, but one of the things that people don't realize is how close John Lennon and George Harrison were. I didn't know that. Wow. I didn't know that either. I didn't know that. Um, because you would think, because Paul and John were such close writing partners, you would think that, you know, honestly, it, 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 I know we haven't gotten to this point yet, but I had a book that was published in 2014 called Channeling Harrison about my experiences with George Harrison. And I was not a Beatles fan. I couldn't understand why these experiences were happening. Once they started in 2010, they never stopped. It's still going on. And um, so, th so that book was published in, in 2014. And then George and John contacted me through a famous channeler in Canada whose name was Bob Murray. And it's a really, really amazing interdimensional story. And just for the record, I didn't believe in channeling or interdimensional communication. I thought anybody could just make that stuff up and there was no way to prove any of it, you know, right. because I thought right. being skeptical showed people I was intelligent. Right. You know, and so what had happened, um, my publisher had taken me to this restaurant in the middle of nowhere and he wanted me to play guitar. And, and there were a bunch of guys who were playing guitars and banjos there that were beginners or intermediate players. And I was a professional guitar player. And so he wanted me to play with these guys to, you know, and so right. for an hour and a half, I'm retuning the G string on my guitar. Okay. I wonder whose name starts with G. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so while, while that was happening, a neighbor of my publisher was having a little gathering at her house, which is right down the road from my publisher. And my name had come up because I had met one of the, na the other neighbors. And I told him I had a book coming out about my experiences with George Harrison called Channeling Harrison and that their neighbor was publishing it. And so my name comes up at this party while I'm at the restaurant with my publisher. And this guy says that, yeah, you know, our neighbor's publishing this guy's book about his experiences with George Harrison. And the woman hosting the party thought this was really weird because she was an editor of spiritual books. <laughs> and she had been contacted by Bob Murray a channeler from Canada who asked L Lori, this woman hosting the party, if she would be his editor for his monthly channeling magazine where he interviewed four people in heaven every month. So after 30 wow. years of doing this, Bob had interviewed Albert Einstein 30 times or Mark Twain 25 times, you know, John Lennon 20 times and George Harrison 10 times. And Lori thought this was really weird that this guy from Canada is sending her channelings with John, John Lennon and George Harrison and her neighbors publishing my book about my experiences with George Harrison. So <laughs> she calls, right? So right. She, puts the, yeah. she calls Bob Murray and says, Hey Bob, did you know there was a guy named David Young who has a book coming out about his experiences with George Harrison called Channeling Harrison. So on October 22nd, 2013, <laughs> that's a Lori, spiritual new year <laughs> right right it's a very spiritual date right so she calls up bob murray and says hey bob do you know about this guy david young you know who's writing this book about george harrison and bob murray says Lori, get on your computer right now because i have a message for david from george harrison and john lennon and i got this message on october 22nd 2013 and this is the message Hi, David. This is George and John. We want to tell you you're doing a wonderful job keeping track of all the stories for the book. And you're really a fine musician, but there's something wrong with the G-string on your guitar because you left it in a place with the humidity. So nobody in the physical world knew that I had a problem with the G-string on my guitar. You know? Wow. And there were other things in the email that were answering questions that my friends had been asking me that month. So how could they possibly know what my friends are asking me? That's incredible. You know, a lot of people, uh, maybe you don't believe in channeling if you're listening, or maybe you just think it's hokum, but I've had a lot of experiences living in New York City, uh, and David and I as well, where um, 
sometimes spirit is speaking through a person okay and it just happens and like david said he didn't believe in any of this stuff and he got visited and and all of a sudden now all this what do you call it kismet um you, you know um carl Jung called it synchrony synchronicity um where things begin to line up and it makes no sense you're literally down the street from the woman that's been asked to be the editor for this guy in canada who's a channeler as a channeling magazine and you're you know like two blocks down and they're telling you that you, your g-string while you're trying to get it to work they're telling you your g-string is messed up because you left it in a humid place and no one knew <laughs> you had left it at your mom's house this all lines up beautifully uh synchronicity as they say yeah it's the kind of thing that you couldn't make up yourself you know what i mean there was no, no way and if that if that timing of all that wasn't crazy enough Okay, my mom was calling in while Lori was reading me this email from Bob Murray. And <laughs> I, I didn't take my mom's call because I was busy having my mind blown, you know. Yeah. And my mom called back a half hour later and said, David, you can't believe what just happened. And I said, no, mom, you can't believe what just happened, you know. And so I told her what just happened. And she said, well, while you were getting that message about the G string on your guitar, Paul McCartney was on television. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah, Paul McCartney was on television. He was doing a press conference. And the host asked Paul McCartney, Paul, are you writing or collaborating with anyone nowadays? And on international television, Paul McCartney said, I'm still writing and collaborating with John, John Lennon. And once in a while, I get together with George. <laughs> so that was all timed at the same minute. The same minute. That's incredible. That Right. I'm telling you, this is like this is stuff that is as skeptical as I tried to be. It was hard well, to stay skeptical, you know? Yeah. You know, sometimes people get rigid, um, you know, because it, like you said, uh, it, you sound intelligent or you gain respect. But when you start hearing that Paul McCartney and others are doing this kind of work, um, you know, it just kind of makes you go, hmm, you know, you know, it's, it's not like we're, you know amazing people it's like we're digging deeper is how i look at it we're going deeper we're unlocking those lotus petals as they say um you know there's nothing wrong with being amazing <laughs> you're right you're absolutely right you know? and you know i'm sure you have many listens listeners out there that do some kind of healing work whether it's reiki or massage yeah. therapy or some kind of healing work and you know, your clients say beautiful things about you and your and the work that you do in your healing work. So why should you wait until after you're dead sometime in the future? Why should you wait to start appreciating what you're doing when other people are, are appreciating what you're doing and saying beautiful things about the work that you do? Self-love is part of this whole thing. You just said something very, very, very profound. Uh, and I appreciate that you said that. Um, and a lot of us, you know, you know what? go ahead. One of the biggest problems that I see people having, because I did 500 meditation events called the portal between heaven and earth, and I've done 400 psychic readings for people. Okay. And one of the biggest obstacles that people have that get in the way of their happiness is feeling worthy. Now, when I first got into spirituality, when I was 22, I completely didn't feel worthy absolutely didn't feel worthy, you know? And it took so many experiences for me to finally start to feel worthy. But what I want to say about this is that there's a way that you can teach yourself. There's a technique that you can use that will help people who have a problem with feeling worthy, right? So first of all, first of all, I, I would ask somebody, do you think God or spirit wants you to be happy? Yeah, most people would say, yeah, I want, I think God wants me to be happy. Okay, great. Do you think God wants you to feel good about yourself? Yeah. Of course, common sense. Of course, God wants me to feel good about myself. Do you think God wants you to feel worthy? Well, that would make sense, right? Well, so that yeah. means that anyone who tells you that you're a sinner, which makes you feel bad about yourself, which makes you feel unworthy, has to be the opposite of God. That's is there yeah. any argument on that one? 
I got no, not at I, all. Okay, I, good. I, I, I was just thinking of all those stories in the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, where the person didn't feel worthy. And through trials and tribulations, they realized, I'm standing on this, this sacred ground. I don't need to apologize. Uh, and, you know, I'm, j I'm just you mind-blowing. Thank you. I really so appreciate let me tell it. You some, let me tell you a technique that I, that I teach people of how to sure. feel worthy. So everybody out there has guides. Everybody. Right. You can't be existing in this physical world without having guides on the heavenly side who are looking down on you, helping you out, guiding you. Like when you get a strong, strong feeling to when you're walking down a street to cross to the other side of the street, there's no logical reason. Right. Right. But but after that feeling just won't go away, you, you go to the other side of the street and you run into somebody you haven't seen in 20 years. It's like, oh, that's why I was being guided to cross the street. Now, just so so you know. What most people think is this is spirit guiding them. Mm -hmm. You could say that's true on a certain level, but on a deeper level, what it is is your guides are guiding you. Okay? So the thing is to increase your connection with your guides, right? So right. most of the most people reach out to their guides or to God or to spirit right. um, when, when things are terrible. Right? That, right. That's, part of human nature right but the thing right. is is that when you when you friendship is two ways friendship is giving and receiving so if the person learns to reach out to their guides in the good times and in the times when they need help or protection or healing or something like this the more you nurture that relationship the more a person feels worthy when they need something wow creating that divine connection and keeping it keeping it yeah um keep what's the, what's the word i'm looking for you keep nurturing it there it is mm -hmm. you take that relationship and you keep nurturing it and it is a give and take thank you david that's phenomenal you're welcome one of the things that, that the way this happened is that in 2014 i started doing these events um, promoting my book, Channeling Harrison, and the events were called David Young Channeling George Harrison. Mm -hmm. And every night that I did these events, five or 10 or 15 people shared that their mom or their grandmother or their best friend from childhood showed up to them in spirit, gave them a trip all around heaven, and they described it all. And it was really amazing. And I had never had one of those experiences. So when people started sharing that on the first night, I'm like, wow, this is, this is wild. You know, and they never taught me about this in music school, you know? No. And I, <laughs> and I thought I was just a good flute player, you know? Um, right. But I started to get used to the fact that every single night, 500 events in a row, people were sharing these experiences, you know? And then after six months, I got used to that, you know, because if you hear this three or four nights a week from five or 10 or 15 people, after a while, it feels normal because you've heard it like 100 times or 200 times, right? Right. But, but then something really weird happened because that didn't seem weird anymore. The weird thing that happened is that three people saw Jesus standing in the same spot in the room. Now, I grew up Jewish, so really, where are you going to put that in your brain? You know, you're playing a flute at a meditation, you know, three people see Jesus in the room. And by that time, I had been talking to George and John through Bob Murray, the channeler in Canada, and these guys knew everything about me. They knew my right. nickname as a kid. They knew when I had a pimple on the back of my neck. I'm telling you, these guys knew everything about me. Okay? And... And so I called up Bob Murray. I said, hey, can you try to channel Jesus? Because three people saw him in the same spot of the room last night. And I, I'd like to know, like, why? You know, what, what was different, you know? And so Bob said, well, I can't guarantee I can con connect with Jesus, but I can, I can try. So I said, okay, I'll hold over here. I'll just wait here, right? Okay, so I'm waiting for two minutes to see if Jesus is going to pick up the phone, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, really, can you imagine? Dial a master. Dial a master. Right? <laughs> and um, so after two minutes, Bob said, okay, I've connected with Jesus. What do you want to ask him? 
my mind went blank. I couldn't think of anything to say. And all I could think of was to say, this is so weird. Growing up in a Jewish family, I never thought I was ever going to have a conversation with you. Um, so I, I just, it feels so strange. And he says, well, I can understand that. I grew up in a Jewish family also, which made me crack up, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Because I could tell he was trying to be approachable to me and he was, and he was being funny with me because he knew I was nervous and mm -hmm. it was odd. And he grew up in a Jewish family too. So, you know, talking to somebody with his name at this point, you know, he could understand why it was weird. So I said, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Because I don't know what to believe about what I've heard about you. I also don't know what not to believe. And so the first thing he says is I don't believe in rituals. When people do rituals, they think that they're getting closer to God. But because a ritual is done so many times over and over mechanically, after a while, it's not coming from your heart. It's not coming from love. And the only way we really get closer to God is through opening our heart and through love. And I thought he was making a reference to the Catholic Church. But then the more I thought about it, every religion has rituals that people do over and over again. And after a while, it, it's, it, it's, you know what I mean? It's just like a bunch of, yeah. how fast can you get over with it? it you it's, know? Um, it's the opposite of mindful meditation. Or, um, and yeah. this is why they discourage uh, idol worshiping. Uh, you know, just going up to this thing and, and bowing. You know, you're not supposed to do that. Um, it's a true heart connection in the moment at the time that keeps that relationship, as we talked about earlier, um, open and nurtured and, and consistently communicating back and forth. Yeah. So that was the first thing he said to me. He doesn't like rituals. Okay. The second thing he said to me was he didn't like pedestals. He said when people put others up on high pedestals, the only thing they got was a stiff neck from looking up, which made me laugh. And it's obviously what he was talking about, right? Yeah. And then the third thing he said was like just an absolute shocker. He said, I did not create Christianity. I never expected yeah. to, right? Uh yeah. And and wow. so from that point forward, Jesus and Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene were appearing at my events to people from that day forward up until the present. And then they started bringing their friends. You know, they're, they're really good friends with Buddha and Krishna and Moses and Kuan Yin yeah. and Isis. You know what I mean? They're right. like uh, the, all, all the goddesses, like they play Mahjong on Tuesday nights, you know, and the guys <laughs> go out and they play football on Saturdays. You know, they have a team. Jesus has number 33, you know, Krishna <laughs> number 22. Um, you know, they always have the same numbers. So this is why people don't confuse them, right? You know what I mean? Because you got to have that same, you got to have that consistency, you know? Right. And so over the, from basically from 2014 until 2020 when COVID started, um, 3,000 people had experiences with the goddesses or the ascended masters. There were, there were 1,500 people who had experiences with Jesus, his wife, Mary Magdalene, and Mother Mary. 1,500 other people had experiences with Buddha, Moses, Krishna, Kuan Yin, Isis, Archangel Michael, Archangel Gabriel, Gandhi, John Lennon, George Harrison, you know. And right. so w the reason why I was bringing this up is that when, when that thing started, this, it felt like the craziest thing in the world. Like, I couldn't even believe people were actually sharing that in, in you know, in public. Right, wow. because you got to understand, it's 2014, 15, 16. People weren't talking about channeling so much, you know. No. Um, but one of the things that happened over time was it was so consistent. Every night, it was so consistent, and I got so used to hearing people, five or ten or fifteen people sharing. Jesus showed up to me. Buddha showed up to me. Mother Mary showed up to me. Mary Magdalene showed up to me. I got so used to hearing that, that yeah. after a while, it just felt normal. Because if you, you know, you brush your teeth every day, right? So brushing yeah. your teeth is a normal thing you do every day, right? And, and let's say you work with the same people four days a week. 
Right. You get comfortable working with those people. So I got really comfortable working with Buddha and Jesus and Krishna and Moses and yeah. all the whole team, all, all the goddesses, you know. And I could see when they would appear to people, I would see a little sparkle over their head. Okay. So if the, par if the sparkle was a silvery color, I knew that was George. And if the sparkle was kind of like, a, like an eclipse is the closest way I could describe it, then I knew that was John Lennon that was appearing to the person, right? If right. Mother Mary was appearing to somebody, I knew it was his royal blue. If Buddha was appearing to somebody, the sparkle was orange. Okay, right. if Saint Germain appeared to somebody, it was this violet color. Wow. And I was able to see this three or four nights a week for six years. That's incredible, David. I never expected it. I mean, who in no. the world would expect anything like this, you know? You and didn't ask for it, yeah. Yeah, I really, <laughs> I didn't ask for it. I really didn't, you know? Yeah. And a I lot don't. of times, a lot of times the, the Reiki practitioners and the psychics and the channelers and the people who did spiritual work would come to my events to recharge their batteries, okay? And I heard hundreds of psychics who were sitting in the audience would raise their hand and they would say, I can see George Harrison standing on one side of you over here, but, but why is John Lennon standing on the other side of you if his name isn't in the advertisement and his name isn't on the book? Why isn't John Lennon's name in, in the book? I never said a word about John Lennon in, in those, in those <laughs> things. I'm going to put on my jacket. I'm a little cold. I, I had an experience as a kid and this experience was so profound. It, it made me, believe that this world is not real this world is an illusion so as i went through life i went to catholic school and i explained this experience and i got paddled i was told i was lying and all this and i insisted i'm telling the truth so it finally got to the monsignor i had to sit with the monsignor and he said brad certain experiences <laughs> in this world are just for you and so that stigma let's put it this way carried me through most of my life until I just said, you know what? Let's share these, these stories. Let's share my story. Let's, and that's the whole premise of Awakened Nation. I wanted people to share extraordinary stories. And what you're talking about today is not only blowing my mind, but I feel incredibly honored that, that you are here today to share this, simply because the, the, the power and the love behind the work you do, because I've sat in the audience and I'm in tears, just from music, it opens the heart. It opens us up to higher dimensional thinking and feeling and seeing. And um, the gift you bring to the world, David, I want to. I want to thank you. Thank you so much for bringing that um, to the forefront into the modern world. Thank you. Well, you know, you know, when when we were growing up, let's say fifty years ago or forty years ago. Um, this stuff was not in the mainstream. No. And nobody talked about near-death experiences. Now, one of the things that's, that I found out, because I perform music at the conferences for people who've had near-death experiences, because it's such a perfect fit. You know, I create this frequency. That frequency exists in heaven. People have had near-death experience, so they've uh, experienced heaven. And so they have these really profound experiences at my events because of that, that frequency that I create. And mm -hmm. it was really, it, it was a big honor for me once I realized that I had this other mission besides just playing music. I loved playing right. music. I've been playing music since I'm a kid, you know, and right. I, you know, always loved it, you know, but this gave me a higher purpose for my music because I realized that my music, had become a portal between heaven and earth. And that's why I eventually changed the name of my events to a portal between heaven and earth. So they were originally called David Young Channeling George Harrison. And then they were called David Young Soul Ascension Workshops. Because right. people were explaining during the workshops, um, after their experience, that they felt like their soul was ascending. Right? Right. And then... And, I, and then I started telling people that we were in this age of ascension. And then a couple of years after I started talking about this and talking about it in interviews, 
And it yeah. became a popular thing to say that we're living in this age of ascension now. It's what so I much find... more acceptable. It's so much more acceptable yeah. to share near-death experiences mm -hmm. now. And I can tell you a piece of information that I learned that, that these conventions that is really, really amazing. But do you know why about 80 years ago, more people started to have near-death experiences? Do you know why? Because 80 years ago, they, they invented these electronic paddles that they put on somebody's chest when they have a heart oh. attack. Yeah, okay? they bring them back. They bring them back. Because before that, if you had a heart attack, you just you died. But now yeah. we have ambulances and we have all of the stuff. And this is the way they can bring people back after they have died, which is called a near-death experience. So once they invented these paddles with, you know, with the electricity in it, more people came back after their near-death experience and then shared their experience with the first person they saw when they woke up. And most people wake up in a hospital and talk to their nurse or their doctor in the hospital. So that means that means that there are actually 20 million medical records in America that include in their medical records their experience of their near-death experience that they told to their nurse or their doctor in the hospital. So that's incredible right there, right? But yeah. there's, another, there's another level of it that really takes it up a notch. Of those 20 million people, there's millions of Christians who have had that experience, millions of Jewish people who've had that experience, millions of Hindus who've had that experience, millions of Buddhists who've had that experience. You know what I'm saying? So what that yes. proves, that scientifically proves that everybody goes to heaven regardless of their religion. Yes. I, I've always agreed with that. And in the Bible, it says, Paul said, I knew a man who went to the third heaven. I don't know if he was in his body or if he was out of his body, but he went to the third heaven. And when I say that to people, they're like, what are you talking about? And it's like, well, that means there's more than one heaven. And sometimes people, do, they just they want to read something and they, they glom on to the dogma rather than the experience that a person is actually having. And it's, uh, it's opening the heart to this communication that I believe God has a very uh, specific uh, way of communicating that if we catch it, it's as, it's as wonderful as being able to see a sunset uh, and, and a moonset in the same day. It's, it's that amazing, all amazing. Uh, and mm. and uh, it's just really wonderful that you can share this. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. I, I, I had no idea any of this stuff really existed at all. Um, but one the, I want to make a comment about something you said about, about these different heavens. Yeah. I don't want people to think that there are different heavens, like Jewish people go to one heaven and Buddhist people go to another heaven. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. want people to think that because that's not the way it works. We okay. all land at a certain part in heaven. It's, it's universal for, for people of all religions. And what happens is that the same way that we progress spiritually, that we have the potential to progress spiritually, physically, while we're in the heavenly dimension, in our afterlife, we have that same opportunity to progress spiritually. So everybody, regardless of their religion or whatever, they land at the certain, a certain place in heaven. And how long you... you you stay in, let's say, first base of heaven, right. right? Depends on your spiritual awareness. So you can you could stay in first base for, let's say, fifty years of eternity, or you could stay in first base in heaven for five weeks. Yeah, then you can move up to the next next level. You know, I I've always thought it was pretty selfish and downright mean. For someone to say, well, I'm going to be in heaven and your religion is not, or you people from over here, you're not going to heaven, I am. And I, I've always found that kind of like, hmm, maybe you don't really understand God, <laughs> you know, because you just, you nailed it. You know, it's like we all get into heaven and we go to different places and we keep working. You know, it, it isn't like we've just earned this prize and now we're done. 
it's like there's a continuous evolution of soul uh onward and upward higher vibration whatever you want to call it but we're always learning something new you know i want to tell you something that kind of was a real mind opener it was a real just a huge thing for me because you know there's so many people i know who say oh i'm this is my last lifetime on earth man i don't want to come back here again i'm meditating i'm doing my spiritual work i don't ever want to come back to have to live another physical life because i've graduated i've grown to a level where i don't have to come back anymore Okay, right. now that's what I believed for 30 years. And during one of my conversations with George and John through Bob Murray, they explained to me that that wasn't true. Okay, and have you ever heard somebody who had a near death experience say to you that the angels in heaven said, It's not your time yet, and we need you back on earth? Have you ever heard anybody say that they were told by the angelic beings, we need you back on earth? That is because we are living in the time of ascension right now. And all the souls who are the evolved souls have been reincarnated now for this ascension because the angelic beings need awakened, enlightened spiritual people on earth to help bring in the age of ascension. So that is the true meaning behind we need you back on earth. Wow. Yeah, almost everybody who's had an NDE, near death experience, they they always say that. They say that, you know, they they were just about to reach to go further and they said no, no, no. We need you back on earth. I'm honestly coming to the conclusion, David, that cuz sometimes I've asked myself, well, why am I here? You know, we just moved to Denver. Why am I in Denver? You know, <laughs> why am I in Vegas? You know, I just kind of start asking myself, what am I, what am I doing in Sin City? What am I doing up here? And it's really each soul, each person who's incarnated at this time, they're stabilizing the matrix so that we can ascend. There is a, a stable way of doing it, and every soul counts. I want to tell you something else that I haven't talked about yet with this reincarnation. Okay, sure. So most spiritual people believe that we've lived before. Right. So, right. So if, if we can take that illusion out, that we reach a certain point, and then we don't have to reincarnate anymore, because as much of a skeptic as I was, when I did the 400 readings that I did, there were many people who I did readings for, who I realized had been reincarnations of famous spiritual people from history. Oh. Okay. So these people, half of these people knew who they were in other lifetimes. And these, I'm going to tell you right now that these people from other lifetimes are the people that we call the masters and the goddesses, which proves that we have to reincarnate again, even if we become a master, even if we become a goddess. We have to reincarnate. Why? Because we are needed on earth now. It's that cycle. It's that time. You know, and time is an illusion. It's just a period, a moment. You know? I, I've come to the conclusion that life and learning is never ending. It's perpetual. Right. And I want to tell you something. You would think you would think that if a person achieves a really, really high level, level of consciousness in a past life, that they're going to be born into this life. And from the minute they're born, they're like an angel every minute of their life. And they got the golden <laughs> halo over their head you know, and all this stuff. And we have, there's this thing called human nature. Right. And there are people who have been masters in other lifetimes and who still make the same human mistakes yeah because every time we come back into another lifetime most of us don't have any memories of those other lifetimes yeah some people have memories of it but most people don't and let me explain something to you i have these ways of explaining these things that are very simple so let's just say we have a woman who name is whose name is eileen 
Okay, and mm-hmm. Eileen loves to play the piano. She plays her whole life. She lives for 80 years. She started playing when she was five. She's played the piano for 75 years, her whole life. Now, when she dies, or what I call transitions, because it's a transition from the physical world into the heavenly world. Our physical bodies have cells and molecules and atoms, right. and our heavenly bodies are made of light. So, because our heavenly bodies are made of light, and because everything travels at the speed of light, which is almost instantaneous. Everything in our light bodies, everything in the heavenly dimension manifests at the speed of light, which is now. That's why that's how you explain in one way the eternal now in heaven. Boom. Mind blown. Again, I hope everybody who's listening is uh, writing some of this down or meditating on this, you know, because uh, I think we're doing a spiritual exercise right now through this whole interview. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, to not only, uh, I'm just going to say this, David, you are living right on the cutting edge, your spirituality, your talents, and your abilities. You are living proof that someone can embrace this because I know there may be a lot of people listening right now who have separated their spiritual life from their physical life. So they go to work every day, they keep their head down, then they come home and they go on some retreat and they don't tell anybody about it. You are living proof, our talents, our creative nature, our expression, all into oneness. Um, and, and I really, I see that in you and I've seen that in you since day one. You live what you preach, you live what's in this kernel inside. Um, and I love that about you. Oh, thank you, bro. Well, you know, we just keep following the breadcrumbs <laughs> of, of, of yeah. spirituality, right? You know, we learn yeah. a little bit. Okay, we well, can... And then we learn a little bit more and we start putting the pieces together of all this stuff so we can have understanding. And, you know, a lot of times people say that, you know, the young kids of today, oh, man, they are so much more spiritual than we were, than our souls were when we were born. But what I teach people is that the difference between being born 50 years ago and being born now is that most of our parents and grandparents 50 years ago did not believe in spirituality. They didn't believe in meditation. They didn't believe in anything about higher consciousness because they were focused on survival. Right. Kids nowadays. So let's just say that 50 years ago, you had a person who, a a little kid who says, Hey, grandma, grandma, um, in our last lifetime, I was your mom and we wore these kind of clothes. And we lived in this kind of a house, right? 50 years ago, the grandma would say, yeah, that's very nice. Just don't say that to anybody else, right? Right, exactly. But nowadays, nowadays, when your little granddaughter or your grandson says something like this to to you, you don't shut them down. You're like, tell me more. Because this is like a free psychic reading for the grandma. Yeah, it is. (laughs) Uh, It's funny because of... I, uh, there are people who fight this whole reincarnation thing and saying it's impossible or it's not in this book. The book doesn't say that it's a, and um, I crack up because you'll see this four-year-old who can play, you know, Rachmaninoff without a thought. They're just, that's <laughs> why I was saying this. That's yeah. why I told you the whole thing, bro, because let's say that person's played the piano for 75 years. They get to heaven at the end of their life and we get to do whatever we want, whenever we want all the time in heaven. One more time. Yep. Whatever we want, whenever we want, all the time. So this woman, Eileen, who's played piano her whole life, she's in heaven now. So she's playing piano all the time, and she's staying in practice, and she's doing really good. So what happens is, let's say 20 years of Earth time go by, in eternity for her, and she gets reincarnated into a little baby's body. And when she's five years old, she goes to one of her friend's house, and her friend has a piano, and she sits down on the piano and plays Beethoven or, or Mozart. And everybody right. looks around like this is magic. She's been practicing for 20 years in heaven. She right. played for 75 years before that lifetime. That's how this makes sense. 100%. You know, I, I came into my family with certain abilities that no one in my family has. No one, not one. And um, so I felt very alone. Then when I met my stepfather, he got me the discipline I needed to take these skills to a completely different level. And nobody knew where all this talent came from, you know, or whatever you want to call it, uh, innate abilities. 
And so through the years, I've made a living with those God-given abilities. And they are talents that I've earned through lifetime after lifetime. I mean, it's the only answer because it's not genetic. That, that is damn sure. Hey, you know, wanna, nobody in my family has these abilities. I want to I say something about God-given talents. Because I was the worst flute player in my class. <laughs> <laughs> to me, to me, the God-given part is not the talent, but the God-given talent that we, the God-given part that we have is the desire. Whoa. Yeah. We have the love for something. I, you know, once I started getting good at the, the recorder, even though I was the worst in my class the first year, once I started getting good at it, I nurtured it. Yeah. Like a, when you have a flower, you, you, you nurture it or you don't, if you don't nurture it, it dies. And if you do nurture it, it grows. And so we, I don't really believe that God gives us a talent. God gives us a desire to use our creativity with something. That's a really great way to put it. Uh, because, you know, if you look at some of the greatest athletes, some of the greatest musicians, you just, you said it. They were the worst at the beginning. It's a living testament that if you really, really love something, you'll put your love into it. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, as we get better at something and we enjoy it more and we get past the learning curve, right. then, we're in a, then we're in a place where, you know, it can be even more enjoyable because then it, it's flowing through us, not necessarily from a mental place, but it's easier, you know? Yeah, totally. Much, much more so. You're, uh, you got a chance to work with Paul Simon. Am I, am I correct on that? No. Um, who have you worked with? The player who played with Paul Simon on Still Crazy after all these years, that's Tony Levin. He's played on every Peter Gabriel album. Um, he's toured with Peter Gabriel for 40 years. And I got to record this great album with him and Jerry Murata in Woodstock, New York, at Jerry's studio that's called Dreamland. The funny thing about this is that I've been saying for all these years that I've been doing these events that heaven and dreamland are the same place. <laughs> <laughs> and so we made this album called Love Wins, and it, it's a vocal album with all meaningful songs. You know, there's, there's, no, um, there's no romantic songs or anything. It's all songs right. either about equality or about spirituality and one of the songs is called Heaven is the Place That We All Go. Uh, another song is called Everybody in the World is Going Crazy. You know, um, right. and there's another song called The Other Side of the Clouds, which is about the fact that everybody on the other side of the clouds is happy. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Tony Levin is one of the greatest bass players of all time. I've been really yeah. fortunate to, you know, with all the albums that I've made, I've made many of them in Minneapolis, many of them in Los Angeles or in New York. And so I got to work with many of the best musicians in the world who were played with Rod Stewart and Tracy Chapman and Tori yeah. Amos and James Taylor. You know, just yeah. all of these great musicians who have, I've learned so much. That's phenomenal. And it shows in your career. I mean, you just... Your discipline as a musician, I've always admired. But you started out like kind of rock and roll, am I correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, I, I, I actually I never dreamed I'd be playing the flute like this in my career. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, I can see. You know, you, your gratitude is is right there in everything you do. Um, you and I met through your brother and uh, ex sister in law, um, <laughs> and, and I mean, I, wow, we're talking like 1987, 89, and around there, it just flew. It just flew by. It flew mm -hmm. by. I'm going to ask you this question. This is the lightning round, David. <laughs> um, what about you um, should we know about you that maybe we don't know about you? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Like, where do you go with the thing? With <laughs> what what you're, should you know about you? me that you don't know about me? Yeah, because well, you're pretty really, much you're pretty much an open book. You were in an RV, right. uh, and you were doing interviews with friends of David, and you were doing yeah. you're on the road, and you share your life so much. But is there something about you that we don't know yet? Yeah, I'm a kick ass ping pong player. I love to play ping pong. Is that what you mean? Yeah, <laughs> that's incredible. Who would know? That this is yeah. very competitive. Are you, are you? Oh, let me tell you, ping pong players are crazy. They are so yep. competitive. 
You could play at a ping pong club for six months and nobody's going to even talk to you because they want to make sure you're not competition. I'm telling you, it's so competitive. It's crazy. Um, That's insane. I'm not That's like funny. That. I just like to play. Yeah. My father is a big ping pong player. I would just, so this is cracking me up. We had a table in the basement and he would just, he would do tricks. That's how good he was. Uh, wow. Ping pong extraordinary. Well, you know, most people don't know that I, I'm a singer and a guitar player and that I, you know, played with so many people as a guitar player. And that's what I thought I was going to do with my life. Um, before the, yeah. the flute part, the recorders took over my career, you know, right. Um, it was really an amazing thing to, you know, when I was playing rock music or singing and writing songs, I, I would spend all my money making these albums and really nobody wanted to buy them. And then I started to make the flute music. My early CDs were called Celestial Winds. Right. And when I started making the flute music, then all of a sudden there was, um, there was a real demand for it because people needed music to relax to, to meditate to, you know? Right. Um, and I happened to be ahead of a wave. You know, I caught this wave of instrumental music. That's how I sold a million CDs, you know? I sold a million CDs by selling 500 or 1,000 CDs every week at these festivals that I was doing. Now it's not, I don't want to say it was easy back then, but it's just so much more difficult because the CD market is not really how people buy music and people are so right. used to doing you know downloads or streaming and you know i've had 25 million streams of my music wow yeah and you're uh grammy nominated am i correct what album was grammy yeah. nominated which one renaissance was nominated for a grammy in 1999 and then for best instrumental album i didn't win some guy named kenny something with a really short name um won that. <laughs> and and then in 2007 I was nominated for Grammy for Best Instrumental Album for my album, Solace. Now, the way, just so you guys understand how a Grammy nomination works, anyone who has already won a Grammy right. can nominate somebody for a Grammy if they feel like the album that they've, they've made is Grammy worthy. Right. Okay. And so there was a musical director in Los Angeles. Um, who started using my music on the different soap operas that he was doing the music for, you know, putting the music in. Right. And um, so he was the one who nominated me for the Grammy. But just so you know, it's, it's, it's not the way it looks like on television. It, right. it really, it does, it, it's, it's just not that... It's just not that simple because, you know, people inside the music business are pushing and pulling for the people that they're trying to, you know, pull ahead. And so it's, it's not like there's a bunch of music scientists there with, with notepads and figuring out who wrote the best chorus or anything like this. It's, it's really not like that. It's, it's more of a, just a popularity contest. You know what I mean? It's really, right. it has nothing to do with the deeper aspects of harmony and melody and production and arrangement like these things. It's just, I, it's just not like that, you know, but it's a beautiful thing to get nominated for something, of course. Yeah. Um, but I'm just giving you guys a little insight that that's how it works. So, you know, if you're a musician and you happen to know somebody who al already has been, has won a Grammy, well, then they can nominate you. Now I didn't know this musical guy from the soap operas, he right. wasn't a friend of mine. He was somebody who bought one of my albums and then called my office and said, can we use your music on General Hospital? So I'm like, wow, absolutely great. The, the, the weird thing about it was that I was in Celestial Winds um, with Lisa Franco at the time. And the, our office phone was in Lisa's house. And the day before that we had gotten the phone call, we had been hired. This must have been in like 1991 or 1992, maybe 1992, uh, we had been hired the day before to play at this children's hospital. And it was a children's hospital for terminally, terminally ill kids. And it was hard. It was really, really, really hard. So we were in this hospital playing, going from room to room, playing like a song for each one of these kids who was terminally ill. And it was really, really heartbreaking, yeah. right? 
So Lisa got back to her house afterwards, after that. And, you know, we were both like, we were in no mood or no place to be doing really anything. And she checked her answering machine back when the answering machines had tape. You know, like, remember the old tape machines, right? <laughs> yeah. And so this guy calls up our, the, our office phone in her house and says, Some, I'm, I'm with General Hospital and I want to talk about using your music. And she thought it was another hospital that wanted us to play. And she went to delete that message because there was no way we were going to play another thing yeah, in the yeah. children's hospital like that again. Be, not, you know, I mean, because it was just, it was draining. It was it was draining. That's what it was, you know? Yeah. So she hit the wrong button. She was trying to delete it, but she hit the wrong button and she hit replay. And then she listened to this guy saying, yeah, I'm the musical supervisor. That's the name, the job. I'm the musical super supervisor for General Hospital. And I want to use your music. So that was like the most exciting thing that ever happened to us at that point. You know, <laughs> we were street musicians at that point, 1992, right. you know? And, wow. um, so that's so the first time it was on television was like being in a rocket ship. I mean, that was so exciting. No, that was going around the world, you know. But then each time it was on, it was like, yeah, they're playing it again. All right. OK. You know, I mean, so after the third or fourth time, we weren't even watching the show, really, because, you know, it was, but then when the guy moved from General Hospital to all my children, he took my music and started using it again. You know, then he went to another show called Passions and yeah. used my music on that show. And so that's that's how that started. Well, I have to say, it's been really great talking to you, Brad. I know we're, we're like running Same here, Dave. Here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was going to uh, ask you, what's your favorite memory? And you already went into it. So I, I just, I'm so honored. I'm so jazzed. Uh, I learned a lot today. And I got to thank you, David, for taking some time out here to be on Awakened Nation. Thank you. I know you're in England. You're starting to perform yeah. tomorrow, so you better get some sleep. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. Okay, lots of love, bro. See ya. Thank Namaste. you. Namaste, my friend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hey, everybody. We're going to be ending today's show just a little bit differently. I'd like you to hear some of David's music as we uh, cue out here. Uh, Sit back, relax. Uh, if you want to start meditating, this is the perfect time to do so. And uh, this is a song, one of my favorite songs, actually, from one of David's albums called Greatness. Enjoy, my friends. Bye. <laughs> 